Rosie, what's up? I want every fan that's in here right now to know that you are literally not only super talented, but one of the nicest people, not just in Hollywood, but everywhere. Not true. Not true. <laughs> it's true, you guys. Don't listen to him. He's probably still wearing Miguel Galindo right now. Yes. Yeah. It's the, the, he's, he's stuck in this beard somewhere. I see it. Tell me, Danny, how's, how's it been going? Have you been watching the show from home? I have. I have. I've been watching the show from home. Uh, you know, Lily, my wife, we catch up on it. You know, I know what's about to happen. So I kind of look at her while she's watching the show. Uh, so I get to really take it in twice. So what is she thinking? How is she feeling about everything that she's seen you do through Miguel this season? It's so intense. Yeah, Lily, Lily's definitely the tough guy in the relationship. Uh, so she's not like a gasper. Uh, and yet she's gasped at least <laughs> a dozen times this season. <laughs> y lo que le espera. No, no, es verdad. <laughs> Tienes razón. You know, I'm, I'm really upset that I didn't make today's chat set for 305. For anybody who doesn't know, we are Miami people. 305. And- we should have broken. We should have broken tradition with my Wednesday chats at four to be three o five. You know, we could always change the timestamp for like <laughs> later when people watch it later, like in the future. We could just say it was three o five. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And but Gino Vento will feel left out. He's our other three o five brother from the Mayans MC cast. Yeah, and David yeah. Labrava too. He's he's from. Oh he, yeah, yeah, happy, yeah, happy. Yeah, happy yeah. Also from from Miami. We got a lot of Miami people representing on the hottest show on television. <laughs> so le- it's really funny because I was working on 309 today, and so I started to prep my questions for today. I'm like, I'm like for you, you know, and I and I'm like something is wrong here. I feel like some, and I checked and I go, oh my god, we're doing 308. So I almost came here prepped and started asking you questions about 309. No, fa- fans might be a little disappointed if we started talking about episode nine when they haven't seen that yet. Uh, 308 has plenty to talk about, though. Oh, my God. Absolutely. I want to start with Cristobal, though. Before we get into this deep, dark stuff, Cristobal is enormous. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been feeding him human growth hormone. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that what you had hidden in, uh, in John Denver's... Uh, department the the yeah. growth hormones no everybody thinks it's heroin when everybody says h it's really hgh is what we what we're bringing in oh i see mm-hmm. shout out to john De- uh, juan denver i miss him so yeah. much yeah may he rest in peace <laughs> in pieces um okay so uh miguel galindo's empire is under attack and he cannot move past the death of his mother talk to me about that yeah, I think he's been absorbed with that. You know, it's uh, it's his his mourning. You know, his uh, inability to assess. You know, what involvement he had with it. You know, it's a, a lot of guilt, uh, especially since you know up until episode eight, he thought it was uh, a suicide, uh, and so he's been spiraling and trying to figure out his place in the world now. Um, And, you know, his marriage isn't going very well. So he doesn't really have a place, a sanctuary, a place to go to, to, you know, really uh, discuss what is going on. So the more he pushes down, the more people around him get hurt. Well, and he had, we talked before about how he had this, he found this sanctuary in Palomo and that kind of fizzled out, right? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that fizzled out. Uh, (laughs) I think, no big deal. No, listen, one of the first times uh, that, you know, Miguel experienced any kind of uh, relief, any kind of happiness, you know, uh, was, was when he was with Palomo. Uh, and when that was taken away from him as well, uh, he really had nowhere else to go. So we find him now with, with all of that stuff that he's burdened with and – he finally decides to take the call from the medical examiner and discovers that, yeah, the, his mother's death is not as it seems. Correct. Correct. The medical examiner calls uh, using a lot of medical terms that Miguel doesn't really understand. Uh, it talks about the hyoid bone being crushed and Miguel has to slow it down and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You just tell me what happened. And when he finds out that, the most likely scenario is that his mother was strangled. 
uh, then that causes some issues. So he goes and he visits Maria, um, the longtime housekeeper that um, his wife Emily uh, fired earlier this season. Yep. And we see that Dita continues to cause major damage from the grave. Yeah, well, shout out to Monica Estrada, who, mm -hmm. uh, who played uh, Maria last night. Uh, yeah, that's a big revelatory moment for Miguel. You know, he goes to Maria without, a, you know, a true objective. You know, he's not quite, he doesn't really even know what he's looking for. Uh, but Maria understands that her directive is if Miguel shows up here at any moment, you need to tell him that his wife was involved. And not only his wife, but the Reyes were involved. Uh, and that just turns Miguel's world upside down. You know, this person who was behaving like a victim, a uh, victim of his mother's suicide, uh, sees not only that he was a victim, but his mother was a victim. And I think that that then flips Miguel's uh, predatory nature back on. The truth here is, though, so I spoke to uh, Sarah Bolger. Shout out to Sarah Bolger. Who Shout is, out to Sarah. Who is uh, who spoke to me from her home in Dublin, which, funny enough, she tells me, you know that my dad is a butcher? And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> is your dad named Felipe? Because then we really got to, we have another conversation to have here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah's uh, Irish. Uh-huh. And so she's Irish speaking in an, uh, an American dialect then also speaking Spanish on top uh -huh, of that. So lots of props to Sarah. It's super. But so she was saying, she's like, but what Maria said wasn't exactly accurate. And what she's doing is unfair. Uh, talk to me about that. Because that's not the whole truth. Well, you know, it's interesting when you play a character, you tend to defend that character, you know, as much as you can. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that there were a lot of things going on behind Miguel's back. Uh, and if you talk about trust and, you know, a circle of trust within certainly uh, a marriage, you would think that, you know, you would be able to share information, you know, share relationships. Uh, and I think that uh, Emily was was less than forthright, is what I would say. But we could say the same about Miguel Galindo, too, no? Oh, listen, I'm going to defend Miguel. <laughs> 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 You're like, he, he has his reasons. She does not. No, no, listen, Miguel, Miguel certainly, you know, there, there's a scene with Gino Vento, um, you know, uh, that, that happened, I think it was last season, towards the end of last season, where um, uh, Miguel and Nestor are sitting on the staircase. And Miguel is going through the anatomy of the breakdown of the marriage. And he, he, he alludes to the fact that he doesn't remember when the first lie was told, that he, he told a lie and then she lied back to him. And that, you know, uh, uh, the dominoes started to fall in the marriage from that point on. And they didn't know how to regain it. And that's what we're seeing right now. Speaking, speaking of Gino Vento, shout out to his hair because his hair, he had like a, a, a Lion King mane when we, in, in episode 308 where he goes to, to see him and he's with a girl and he's got this big, gorgeous hair. Shout out to his hair. Yeah, I was a little jealous, to be honest, when I saw all that <laughs> hair. And, and Me too. I thought, yeah, I was like, how are, how are you not getting a head and shoulders campaign, bro? How is, <laughs> how is that not happening? Big time. But in, so in that scene, it seems to kind of reinforce for Miguel, you know, at least partially or at least saying that he's on the right track with what Gino reveal. I mean, sorry, what Nestor reveals that they saw motorcycle tracks where when they found Dita's body. Yeah, I mean, look, that that scene is uh, connective tissue to what actually transpired. It's another piece to the puzzle for Miguel and it's coming from somebody he trusts, you know, maybe, maybe the last person who he really trusts in, uh, in Nestor. So that means there's no trust with uh, El Padrino. Well, the information he's getting is from Nestor, right? right. So he, he doesn't quite know where El Padrino stands. You know, he's, he's needing at this point, he doesn't trust anybody. I, I, I personally don't think that in Miguel's line of work, that trust is something that's easily gained. I think that he suspects everyone. 
I think that, you know, he expects people to be duplicitous uh, because that's how he protects himself. Um, and everything that's happening is just reinforcing that uh, cynicism. Okay. And so while Miguel has all of these other things that he's dealing with, we have this new character that called El Banquero. Mm -hmm. And there's, he's an absolute psycho and I love him. Uh, <laughs> Guillermo. Guillermo does such a great job. Guillermo's doing great, man. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, that's Carla Barada's real life husband, Guillermo. Oh, yeah. And, shout and out to Carla, too. Yeah, shout out to Carlita. I spoke to what, her earlier. What so a talented much, couple, huh? Super. Incredible and, talented uh, couple. He, but, uh, you know, so uh, here comes El Banquero, and he's gunning for Miguel's, for Miguel's business. Yeah. You know, Miguel is no, uh, he's no stranger uh, to people encroaching on his territory. I mean, his father dealt with it, you know, with Lobo Sonora. Uh, now he's dealing with it. Uh, it's not something I think that is, uh, you know, in his mind, considering what he's going through with his mother, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. Like he thinks he has it under control. His eye is totally off the ball when it comes to his business and El Banquero's taking advantage of it. Do we think that Miguel knows of his existence at all? Sure. You know, but uh, the lion doesn't worry about what the gazelle thinks. Okay. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Um, let's see. I wanted to see if there's any, any, uh, if there was any questions in here. I think somebody earlier was asking if so it was something about Emily. Uh, okay. I'll come back. These things go so fast that I. I'm yeah, no, I see. I see Miguel rocks. La mama. You are so fine. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, mom. <Love> you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll just carry on and I'll see what else is coming down. Okay. So sh uh, shall we move uh, into that final scene? We already know how uh, Miguel and Emily like to get down. It, things get rough. They like that. It's cool <laughs> with them. But this was something totally different. And we see that in the end when oh my god emily's glowing and she's like oh that was so hot and you just see miguel like tense frozen and tears forming in his eyes i'm dying to know what was going through his mind mm. i'm so hesitant to even talk about that because i i it's so important for me for the audience to experience that for themselves like i know what i was thinking and uh you know, there was, there was so much going on in that scene. Uh, but by defining it too much, I almost, I, I almost feel like I might take something away from the experience from the audience. So I'm, much, I'm actually much more curious to find out what you thought of that scene, Rosie, and what, you know, the little scrolling uh, uh, sentences. What, 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 what did you guys think of that scene? Well, everybody wants, to, everybody wants to talk about you going back to SVU. That's what I see on here. <laughs> Everybody's like, uh, uh, can, you know, somebody's asking if you can cry on demand. Cry on demand. Um, you know, you're going to have to talk to my agent about that. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a, what, what do they call it? Like Hollywood? What do they call it? Uh, Hollywood magic. Hollywood, Hollywood magic. Ma you know what? It, the, I think the uh, what makes becoming emotional uh, so much more uh, possible is when you have the writing that we have. Uh, when the writers take the time to really plot the uh, the emotional moments, build the build up to when uh, a character would maybe reveal himself or herself, that makes all the difference. So our writers do such a phenomenal job of just laying the groundwork for all the characters that when it does come time for a character to maybe show that vulnerability. It's just there. Okay, it looks like the con general consensus is that everybody thought that he was gonna kill Emily. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, to kind of answer your question without putting too fine a point on it, I think that there's uh, not only with Emily and Miguel, I think within Mayans, within, uh, you know, our world, there's a very thin line between love and hate. And I think that that's the line that was being written on, you know, in that, uh, in that scene. Well, to finish that triangle, let's talk about Easy because Easy got shot uh, 
earlier this season, and we saw that Nestor was protecting these people at the hospital, and that's your guys. So what can you tell me about that? What, what role did Miguel play, if any at all, in that? You know, that, that's a really good question, because I, I thought that myself. Um, I think that uh, Emilio Rivera with uh, El Padrino, El Padrino has, is essentially, you know, the sergeant, the field sergeant mm -hmm. for the Galindo cartel now. And, uh, you know, um, Nestor is under him. He's, you know, he's one, of, he's one of the troops, one of the bigger troops, you know. Uh, but, you know, I think that that was a call that was made by El Padrino. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a call made by Miguel. Okay. Um, but, but I also can imagine that, that El Padrino would be thinking that it benefits the cartel to have a stability within the Mayans and not to have a war. And so him being able to station his men there to pacify the situation is, is maybe something that would be, you know, a benefit to the cartel. Uh, I saw an interesting question here. Uh, somebody mm -hmm. says, would you classify Miguel as a, an anti-hero or a bad guy? Oh, uh, I like the gray area. Uh, and I think bad guy is just too black and white, you yeah, know? And I think, I think anti-hero is much more in the gray. Uh, what I love about what our writers do and what, you know, this whole cast is capable of doing is is provoking an audience to either you know hate the character in one scene and then you know feel for that same character in the next scene sometimes from one line to the next uh and, and when we ride that line i feel like we're in a good spot okay i see a lot of questions about the connection between galindo and the reyes brothers so i want you know one of my favorite topics Um, I, I, I have often thought of that whole thing as a Luke Skywalker situation when he met Felipe, I was waiting for, okay, yo soy tu papá. <laughs> And it, it never Whoa! happened. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about that. Man, I, you know, somebody posted that like a TikTok video or something, uh, playing the scene with Edward James Olmos. I, I, we have got to give a shout out to Edward James Olmos. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the scene between Felipe and Miguel, and then they cut in the scene between Vader and oh. Luke Skywalker. And, you know, I wrote something like, you know, the 10-year-old me is so excited right now, I can't even tell you. Um, but, you know, with any great story, you're going to find crossover. Right. And I think that that that's that's certainly one of them. Uh, I think our stories cross over with all kinds of fantastic fiction. Um, you know, I think that for a time there, especially in season one and some of season two, Miguel was being uh, compared to, you know, Michael Corleone uh, in that he's trying to legitimize his business. He's taking over for his father. You know, his name is Miguel, you know, Michael. Uh, so there, there's some legitimate crossover Uh, between between those stories but when it comes to the brotherhood uh i love the brotherhood uh you know between between uh you know clay and jd uh there's so much complexity that scene the brunch scene uh in yesterday's episode was uh, remarkable uh sulem uh is kind of effervescent throughout mm -hmm. and she brings like this levity to to that relationship Uh, you see Easy really soften during that. And that, that allows for, you know, Angel uh, to just spit the hate that he's feeling because of his situation, right? Uh, and try to knock it all down. So, you know, I just thought that the scene was, you know, incredibly well written and not to be, you know, self-congratulatory to my own people, right? But I, I can't help it. I thought that the scene was, was beautiful. Joseph Lucero, who plays Creeper on the show, is here in the comments. He says you're so the creep. hot. <laughs> Joe, come on, man. You know, you bring the hotness, bro. Come on. <laughs> well, well now, that he, now that he's in the room, I can, I can say that next week we have Joseph Lucero and, oh, in man. the house for our Instagram Live. Man, and, what, what a beautiful human being. I mean, seriously, Joe, I mean, his, his story 
his spirit, who he is, what he brings to the show, you know, his artistry, his vulnerability, his strength. I mean, that, that guy, it's, I could hang with him all day long. Since it's going to be for episode, so it's like the penultimate episode of the season. We're going to have two people next week. So we're going to have Joseph first, and then we're going to have Frankie Loyal, who plays Hank. Oh, my Hank. God. Man, that right, right there is what you call an embarrassment of riches with those two guys. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Hank, you know, in the episode showing his vulnerability with his mother. Mm, yes. Uh, you know, the, the relationship that, you know, that he has in his own mind with Nails. Uh, you know, those two characters are just, they're, they're beautiful, you know, and, and uh, to see that dynamic play out in such uh, a tough place, you know, it's like, it's like that rose that grows in the cracks of the sidewalk, you know, uh, it's fun to see that relationship. Well, what did it for me uh, for Creeper was in the episode where they all go, I think it was maybe six or seven where they go to war and he wasn't going to leave a man down. He's like, Oh, you guys are all fleeing. I, that's not where I belong. I belong over there with, you know, with them, with my brother, make sure everything is cool. And I was like, Oh, that sealed it for me because creeper is a company guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, but so is Joe, you know, that's, that's Joe, that loyalty. That's real. You know, I, I believed it when he turns to camera and he was like, I'm not leaving him behind. But, I mean, that I, 100 i was there the day that they shot that and oh I'm yeah like, yeah i'm like yeah moving on now <laughs> we got that that was amazing i mean it, it, it yeah i mean we'll, we'll save that for next week uh <laughs> then we'll talk more about about the the good stuff from creeper and hank because there's there's really so much more coming up for that um okay let's try to grab some more questions before let's we go. let you go there's been so many and I'm trying to catch some. A lot of them go really fast. Well, you know what you brought up SVU. It's so cool that people. Everyone is talking SVU here. Please talk it about is, SVU. I'll tell you what it's, it is so cool to have people who watch SVU uh, join us on Mayans, you know, two very different shows, two shows that I love, you know, incredibly. Uh, and so to have people follow SVU and then come to Mayans and experience something completely different. Uh, to me, there's just a lot of um, fulfillment in that. Is is there a, a a situation that would that you would be that would make it possible for you to dip back in there, even for like a what's up? <laughs> oh man, Rosie, I wouldn't even know what to say about that at this point. I'm I'm listen. I'm so excited to be here with you and to be talking about Mayans. Okay. Uh, and, but I'll tell you what, I love everybody at SVU. And, uh, you know, I feel so fortunate uh, to have been there for four years. Uh, and, you know, if the situation were to come around, uh, it would be something that I would absolutely be interested in having a conversation about. Okay, look, I'm just the voice of the, of the fans. And, the, and I, I'm asking, <laughs> the, you know, the questions the fans are asking, okay? I look, got you. I, hate, I hated your character in SVU, but I love your character on my end. You know what? That's what I love about what we do is, you know, you can have a very, very strong opinion and, uh, you know, that's that you can live with that. You can own that. Yeah, but my favorite characters are the ones that I hate mm. because that means that it's bringing out something in you that's just very, like, passionate. I met J.R. Bourne the, uh, the other day and yeah. I'm like, I hate you. I hate Isaac so bad. Yeah. And then he's such a great guy. And I'm like, no, why are you so cool? No, he's so cool and so gentle. I mean, the guy, he's, he's a fantastic actor. I love what he's doing. Uh, you know, this is, this is what I'll say about, uh, you know, uh, Miguel in comparison to, to Nick on SVU. The thing that I think ties them together, and when you look at both characters, you would think, well, one is obviously the other side of the coin, right? They, they right. have nothing in common. But in reality, uh, the writers on SVU, I think, did a fantastic job of showing Nick's vulnerability the same way that they showed his aggression, the same way that, you know, they showed some of, uh, uh, of, of his darkness, right, uh, of his pain. Uh, and what I love about Miguel is that he has a similar duality, right? Mm -hmm. you, you see and you've seen through the first two seasons this ruthless uh, businessman who does what he needs to do and and he functions out of you know uh, intimidation and fear 
Uh, but then you flip that and he's also a family man, right? Who's trying to legitimize his family and move away from all of that. And then you work into season three and he's dealing with this incredible loss, right? This chasm that exists inside of him and, and he can't dig out of it. He, in fact, he, it feels like the more he digs, the deeper he gets. Uh, those, the characters are similar in that they, they have this struggle and they live in that gray area. I like that. I mean, I love them both. I, I want to see a TikTok where Nick arrests Miguel. <laughs> That's a challenge for whoever is out there doing these, you know, the young people. Because my also, I don't even have TikTok. <laughs> Soy una vieja. Uh, mira, I don't have TikTok either. <laughs> um, okay. Danny, you show the duality. Oh my God, it goes so fast. The writing, oh, okay, I lost it, sorry. This, no, this, uh, this. I just saw Uruguay, Uruguay. Shout out to Uruguay, Qué Argentina, viva. Peru, Argentina. my people in Peru. Lots of people are on here. Saludos. Okay, so we have two more episodes to go. I can't believe it went so fast. What can you tease about what is ahead? Rosie, you've seen 309. I have, but I can't say anything about it. Right, but look at me, look at me. We're gonna tell the audience through our eyes in 309. <laughs> that was me holding my breath for as long as I could because I'm just saying 309 if you thought 308 was tough and I certainly thought 308 was tough 309 look at my eyes things go to another level let's say that man I when I watched 309 I I left the room and physiologically there was a shift in me because the work all the way around everything that's been happening since you know episode 301 it all kind of comes to a head in 309 i mean it is the penultimate episode but that ultimate is within that word penultimate and i think that it's earned that name uh you know in 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 the course of this season it left me really afraid for 10 because i'm like if that's where we're going for the penultimate that last one is going to be fire. The last one is um, paradigm shifting. It shifts everything. Tectonic plates just, you know, bust through the surface of the earth. It's going to be, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. As an, as an, I'm really curious as an actor, like, is, like when you're done shooting, are you able to just take Miguel off like a coat and, and move on with your life as Danny? Or is it like, does it linger? Uh, do you mean like a yellow raincoat or do you mean like just any, any regular coat? Um, <laughs> no. I, it, yeah. You know, it's, um, I find that after certain scenes, for sure, there's a residue of, uh, you know, what Miguel has been through. And this season has been so emotional. Uh, and to get to that place uh, psychologically, to get to that vulnerability, there's a price to pay. Right. And um, that's not something I shy away from. That's not something I'm afraid of. It's it's something that is, you know, literally the price of admission. If you're going to play this role fully, then you have to inhabit it fully. You have to feel it fully. And your body doesn't know that it's not real. You know, when you tap into whatever that is, you tap into that pool of emotion and vulnerability and disgust and self-hatred and self-doubt and you know, that is very real. And sometimes it takes a little bit of um, tequila to just, you know, just just get back to normal. You've been living in LA a lot because that's not a Cuba Libre or anything like that. Well, every now and then I do a Cuba Libre, you know, a little, you know, it, it, it depends. Sometimes it's just seeing my kids. Aww. Sometimes it's just seeing my wife, you know. Sometimes it's it's just that. Sometimes it's, you know, sitting in my car after a day and just, you know, putting the windows down and taking a drive uh, and recalibrating, you know, there's not one way to do it, you know, and you just kind of feel it. Yeah, because eight and nine were really heavy for that character. And I just kept thinking, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do it. You do it because you love it. And I love it. Uh, I, I love playing this character, you know, and as vile uh, and as violent, uh, and as grotesque as, you know, some of his decisions are and some of his actions are, uh, 
the I think the writing uh, makes it mm, complicated and complex and human and inconsistent, and that's exciting to play. I, I spoke to uh, when I spoke to oh my god I almost called her Emily um, Sarah <laughs> Sarah yeah. I asked her I know I've been living in this Mayans world like so hardcore for <laughs> nine episodes that I I'm confusing everybody but because um, people always wonder about the origin story like how mm -hmm. she goes from you know everything that happened with Easy to then meeting Miguel and she kind of said that you guys agreed on a, a on a sort of origin story talk to me about that a little bit yeah you know we met. Early on, we had a, we had a lunch, and we were essentially, you know, uh, given the task of developing the characters. You know, uh, what was on the page was on the page. Uh, there was some backstory, but in a very deliberate way, you know, Kurt and Elgin didn't want to give us too much. They were like, "Go explore and talk about that." And um, you know, some of the things that we discussed, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, was that it was likely that Miguel was involved in some community outreach uh, within Santo Padre, uh, trying to legitimize the business, which is what his father tasked him with. And as he's trying to put on the air of, you know, uh, a Santo Padre uh, philanthropist, uh, businessman, socialite, he runs into somebody who is trying to climb that ladder as well you know, and, and that being uh, Emily. And as they talk, Miguel sees her not only as somebody who I, I truly feel that he loves her, mm -hmm. uh, that, there is, that there is a genuine love for her. Uh, but I also think Miguel is smart enough to know, you know, if I marry somebody from Santo Padre, that then legitimizes me as from Santo Padre and not from Santa Madre, which is on mm -hmm. the other side of the border, right? Right. So in a way, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a way for him to, you know, push forward this, uh, uh, this mythology of, of Miguel Galindo and who he wants to be. And, and that's why I think uh, Emily because, becomes such a huge force behind the Agra Park and mm -hmm. the, face, the face of leading that, that push because she knows the community. Okay. So that, I think that's what we, that I think that's what where we landed on. But again, that was, you know, almost four years ago, three and a half years ago when when we discussed it. Um, for me, the the takeaway for me is that they are genuinely in love. And we see that, and and, and probably will continue to see that. Um, Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Okay, you guys, make sure we only have two more episodes left of Mayans MC. You can catch it Tuesday nights at 10 p.m. on FX and 24 hours later on FX on Hulu. Sorry, were you going to say something, Danny, and I cut you off? I wasn't going to say something, but I'm glad that, that you, you threw it back to me because I just wanted to thank you for always putting our show on a pedestal. I love uh, it so much. No, I, look, I know you love it because look behind you. You, 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 think have... that I, you think that I put this up when I'm doing these things and it's literally always there. No, I don't think. No, I, I trust you. <laughs> I, didn't tr I didn't trust you the first time you said it. But now we've had multiple. And I, you, you're not going to set that up every time I come here. I don't. No. It's, no. it's there. It's my shows. <laughs> I got one day at a time of, of somewhere. Eso. Right here. I got my, I got my one Man. day at a time mug. I got Vita here. I got all my special shows here. And I, I did see a couple of people talk about how proud they are of how you represent us as a Latino. You know, I, I don't gracias. know if you want to say something like that about that on the way out. Bueno, muchas gracias. Lo agradezco mucho. It's, uh, to me, it is an honor. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly standing on the shoulders of, you know, Latinx performers before me. Uh, and, and it's something that I take, uh, you know, very seriously when it comes to, you know, uh, the legacy that hopefully I'm leaving behind. Um, but, you know, it's, it's people like you, Rosie, who have, no, you've pushed through, man. You've pushed through as well. And you, you, have, you have a mouthpiece. You have a way to push things forward that you like, uh, that, that you get, that, you know, demonstrate, you know, your aesthetic. You're embarrassing me. And, no, but seriously, look, it, 
we, we constantly as actors or as directors or as writers, we're constantly, uh, you know, somebody just referenced it the other day, like we're the peacocks, like we, they put us out there and we represent this, uh, this other group of people, like whether it's our crew that works their tail off and they, they don't get a lot of face time, but they're there and they're there 24 seven virtually. Yep. Um, but it's also people like you who, who come out and you shine a light on us. But what you're doing is so vitally important uh, because there Thank aren't you. a lot of us sitting where you are. And so I appreciate you. I appreciate where you, you know, the struggles that you've endured and thank you for constantly putting us up. On Don't make episode. me emotional. Honestly, I can't do it without you guys. Honest, I mean, you, we go back for years when I was still freelancing and you have never told me no to anything. So <laughs> it, it's, it's a symbiotic re relationship. That uh, it is. Without that you is. guys, you know, I, I don't have these stories to tell. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's back and forwards. And I just love the show so much. I love the involvement of our, of our people behind this. Uh, you know, and a lot of people will say, you know, these, you know, we're always telling these bad stories about us. But, you know, we're going to hear from Joseph next week about how these stories are representative of real stories like his, his real yeah. life story. And these stories are worth telling. Yeah. No, listen, I, I think that there's a, uh, there's, there's a, a definite uh, double standard when it comes to telling stories about crime and organized crime. And, you know, it seems like, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you don't hear a lot of uh, middle-aged white uh, chemistry teachers being asked whether, you know, they feel like they're being stereotyped, you know what I mean? Exactly. Uh, and so, and so it, it's a fine line, right? Uh, I take very seriously the stereotyping of, uh, you know, uh, of our people. Um, and stereotypes come from, uh, you know, lazy writing, you know, and, and I think that our show is far from that. Uh, it's certainly not glamorizing violence. It's showing it's showing the, the repercussions of violence and of choosing the kinds of lives uh, that these characters have either chosen uh, you know, to live or have been relegated to. And so when you're talking about people who are living in the margins, oftentimes that brings violence. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that with our main titles, uh, which have changed you know, this season, mm -hmm. uh, and, and showing the, you know, the development of uh, you know, our presence within this country, uh, it is, it is reflected in our titles, in our titles for the season as well. Every title is, uh, is actually a, a title, uh, a chapter title from the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which oh. is one of the most of American novels because we're telling the most of American stories. So, you know, that, that is, it's very deliberate something that Elgin James uh, had his his finger on the pulse of and was intentional, uh, and we're adding our thread to the fabric of American storytelling. Amen. And really quick, we have uh, uh, all of the, your fans from Latin America. Todos están pidiendo que hables un poquito right, en español. Muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias. Te lo agradezco muchísimo. Tremendo orgullo estar aquí con ustedes. Podemos hacer un poquito de cubaneo aquí. Porque... Ya tú sabes, chica. Dale, dale. <laughs> Pero no. hay muchas, a, a ver si contesta, la gente quiere saber si va a haber un 4. Ah, ok. Bueno, yo creo que vamos a decir que me siento súper bien de la oportunidad de tener una temporada, otra temporada de, de nuestro show Mayans MC. Vamos a ver, vamos a ver. Bueno, para que todos los latinos prendan una velita. Okay? Una velita... Tiene que hacer uh, que hagan un despojo. Despojo. Un despojito, un despojazo. <laughs> thank you, Daddy. You rock. Thank right. you. Can't thank wait you. to see the rest thank of the you, season. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody uh, showing up and throwing up, you know, little little uh, words and icons. And man, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for watching our show. Uh, and uh, that 309, that episode 309. Very it's much my, looking. It's tied for my first favorite with it's 306 and 309, like right there. So, yeah, yeah, no, listen, the emojis for 309 are haven't even been invented yet. That, that's 
I don't know. We just had an update and we got a bunch of new ones. So you got to look at those. Maybe there's some new, okay. some good ones in there right. and the new ones. I'm, I'm going to have to check them out. But uh, I hope you guys really enjoy uh, the rest of the season. Uh, from me, representing the rest of the Mayans family, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, te lo agradezco muchísimo. And uh, I send everybody so much love. Mucho, mucho amor. Mucho amor y cariño. Un abrazo bien fuerte. <laughs> And uh, hey, check out EW.com for my interview with, I had Sarah Bolger, Raul Trujillo, and Sulem Calderon to speak about 308. That's it from my don't self -promotion. Miss it. You don't want to miss those. Dale. All right. Thank you, Danny. Bye. <laughs>